Hey, thanks very much. And uh, Alex, welcome back. Uh, this is obviously a huge opportunity for you. I mean, a former champion, a very recognizable figure in the sport. So what was your reaction to landing this one? Yeah, man, it was uh, it was surprising. You know, the the initial consensus uh, of all the comments online was like how random of a matchup it was, and I was inclined to agree with them. But uh, again, just like a super opportunity. You know, it was actually funny when I caught word of the fight. I was it was it was Tuesday evening, and I was teaching a, a big jujitsu kids class. And, you know, naturally being a, a good instructor, I wouldn't sit there and answer my phone. But I noticed my phone was going off a lot. And then uh, and then our program director walked on the mats, and she was like, "Hey, it's your coach from Dallas," and uh, and I was like, "Oh." okay i either got some really good news coming or some really bad news coming i knew there was some news and uh he's like morono we got pettis on the 19th and it was perfect because it was the same card that, that that jeff was headlining and uh and i was like no way you know coach that fight is on you know i'll call you back after class but let's do it and before that class had finished the fight was announced i had like 20 minutes to kind of like be excited but then as soon as i realized the fight was booked uh, I knew who my like new enemy was. I mean, all the respect in the world, you know, before and after the fight, but, but during fight camp, you know, it, it really kind of changed my focus and everything. And, uh, and again, this is such a big opportunity and there's a lot of, uh, you know, huge gains to make with a victory. And, uh, so I still have the, the most difficult task at hand, which is winning this fight. And then I can't wait to, uh, to, to make those good decisions and get out there. And when you talk about the uh, gains that could come from a win here, I mean, where does a win over Pettis in 2020 put you? I mean, it's been a while since his lightweight title days, but he's still ranked 12th at welterweight and he's, you know, frankly, still Anthony Pettis. Sure, sure. So, I mean, uh, you know, I would always set goals relative to uh, what, what was ever within arm's reach um, just to make sure they were very attainable. Like long term goals are great. But, uh, you know, b- you know, being in fight camps since I was a teenager, I always had like, you know, two to three months to prep and be ready for an eventual like finish on a date. So I always set goals, whether it was fight related or not you know, within like an accurate time frame, And uh, the rankings were never really a big goal because they were kind of far away, you know, like, and then I had put that three fight win streak together and then had that, that, that matchup change and that, that tricky loss against chaos. And that just kind of like resets it. And, uh, and I'm big on like history of fighters and theories. And like, uh, I, I'm going to butcher the guy's name and I apologize, but that Eliasu Dolezeski Dos Santos guy, you know, he won like six or seven fights in a row, you know, finally got to fight Li Jing Liang and then lost it and got kind of like bumped back down. And like the idea there is it's, it's tough to put a streak together at welterweight and it's tough to break into the rankings. And then I feel like I was given a big opportunity to kind of cut the line. And with a win over Pettis, I'm, I'm sure it'll rank me. And then, so I have a whole new set of goals and really a win here kind of opens up the gates for really any matchup in the division whatsoever. And like as a fighter and a martial artist and a fan, that's just a really, really cool. And again, I am certainly the type of guy to not, you know, focus on anything ahead. I have a very daunting task ahead of me on Saturday, but again, with the win, it just, it opens up the floodgates for opportunities and, uh, and it's a good way to get to that next level. Good stuff, man. And, you know, last one for me, um, you've talked about going for the finish in this fight. We know the knock on Pettis over the years has been his ground game and you've got a black belt and six submission wins. Is that an area you're looking to test him at? Um, you know, it's kind of odd. You know, I fancy myself a striker, certainly so does Pettis, but we both have more submission victories on our record than knockouts. And, uh, and it actually comes in the same fashion in terms of guys taking us down and then us actively working off of our backs. Um, you know, Pettis is such a veteran. I, uh, I didn't want to put any restrictions on this fight at all. Like, you know, I, I hope it's a fun striking contest, but but I wouldn't be surprised if he looks to engage the clinch or even looks to wrestle. So I'm going in there with a very free-formed, open mind and really just kind of ready to take the fight wherever it goes. All right. Well, looking forward to it. It looks to be a good one. Best of luck. Cool. Thank you. We'll take our next set of questions from Jordan Ellis with Loki Kamenei. Hi, Alex. I, I just want to ask, you were saying about um, this coming quite early for you. When did you imagine yourself being in this position, you know, fighting ranked guys? Obviously, it's it's not something for 2020. Was you thinking maybe 2021, 2022? How far early are you getting this? I mean, th- again, it, it's kind of an unknown. Uh, I, I was just hoping to put a streak together. Again, staying active is, is, is always very fun. I didn't think I'd get three fights this year, which is great. And, uh, and, and again, I, I don't know, I really didn't have any expectations. I've, I've learned like in life, especially like when, when watching a new movie, 
if you have very low expectations or no expectations, things are often better than, than you would hope for. And again, I just, I just didn't really know, you know, when I was on that, that streak, I was like, you know, maybe with another win or two, I could get a, a higher profile fight, but, but, you know, there's just, there's such a volatility to MMA. I, I again, really had no expectations. So this was all a surprise. And, uh, and I've always been one to jump at a, a good opportunity. And this is certainly one of those scenarios. Yeah, and there's obviously still a lot to do, but you allow yourself to, you know, think about the future and, you know, what might come next. You know, if you, if you win this, you're in the rankings going into 2021 and then you, you've got a potential title run on your hands. Do you allow yourself to think of them things or is it just on the task at hand? I mean, sure. So, you know, I never really had super heavy championship aspirations. Um and for really no other reason than, than my my teammate Jeff Neal, he's a he is champion material. You know, he's headlining this card, and uh, and as a team, you know, coach is always talking about like being the most legitimate by producing champions. He and I are in the same weight class, and uh, and I think goals wise, it was just different. Uh, I have a, a theory on the difficulties of the career post belt uh, a good example and again i have the most respect for this guy but but a good example is chris weidman you know he went undefeated i think maybe six and oh before he got his title fight fought for the belt defended it a few times but then had like nothing but the world's best killers to fight and uh you know lost the belt and then has been kind of like you know chomping at the bit to get back there and it just it, it causes for a very difficult road whereas you know i do believe my teammate jeff can become champion and maintain champion status and if i'm able to get ranked in the top 15 top 10 uh, then i'm just looking at, at big high profile fights if uh, if that that's the case. I would prefer like a cool headliner over, over, you know, looking for gold in that scenario. And, and certainly uh, things change as the situation changes, but uh, you know, I would like to see my teammate Jeff Neal be the champ and I would like to kind of stay in the top 10 and just, and just fight more higher profile guys. You know, if, if, if we can make our, 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 our wins happen on Saturday, when, when we make the wins happen on Saturday. That's cool. And just finally from me, Andy Vettis, um, it was 10 years yesterday, I think, to the day since he pulled off that Showtime kick. I'm sure you've seen it floating about social media. How do you prepare for a guy who's so unorthodox and, you know, so successful with it as well? Yeah, what's funny about that, I remember I was either 19 or 20 years old. I loved watching WEC. If I'm not mistaken, the cards would often happen on Sundays. So, like, right before going to school, I would always watch WEC fights. And I just remember seeing that. And I was like, well, that's the coolest thing ever. And uh, and I was actually a, a fan of Pettis. I remember his debut. He fought Clay Guida. And I think everyone thought he was going to blaze through him. But then uh, then Clay we ended up winning that fight. You know, uh, And uh, it was just, it was interesting. So I've really watched his whole career in the UFC. You know, as like a, 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 as a martial artist, it was just cool to see guys with that, uh, with that sort of skill set. And, uh, you know, everyone is excited to, uh, to like mimic Anthony Pettis in a fight camp. I know when Carlos Diego Fierro fought him, you know, I was training with him and I was being Pettis. And I remember throwing like the craziest, wackiest things in training. And it was so much fun because it's not throwing caution to the wind, but you certainly get to try things you normally wouldn't try. And, uh, and, you know, for the two weeks that I was prepping for this one, I, you know, everyone I was training with was like happy to cartwheel kicks, Superman punches and all that fun stuff. So, uh, so it was actually, it was, it was really easy to, to find guys to work with and, and very fun to kind of troubleshoot that style of training. Okay. Thanks for asking me questions. Good luck with the fight. We'll take our next set of questions from Danny Segura and an agent. Cool. Thank you. Hey Alex, uh, you mentioned how um, you know the, the sort of the reaction of the public that you saw was like, okay, this is a bit of a, a random out of the left you know matchup. But for you, did Anthony Pettis ever cross your mind as a potential opponent while you've been in the UFC? Oddly enough, no. Uh, I, I I still kind of like pictured his, him as a lightweight. You know, and I know he did bounce around. Like, I know he fought Cowboy and then Nate, and those were both at welterweight. But before that, he fought CDF at lightweight. So I just, no, I really didn't consider it. And But then after the fact, I was like, you know what? It's not as out there as you'd think. And, uh, and you know, there was the, uh, the major consensus was, like, it was kind of a random matchup. But after people started to kind of, like, weigh the, the facts and see the history, a lot of guys were like, you know what? This is a really fun fight. And I was happy to get that kind of, like, respect. And, uh, and uh, you know, 
MMA is an extreme sport. Extreme sports bring extreme fans. And I honestly thought I was going to get hammered online. And, uh, and no, man, I, I caught a lot of love. And a lot of guys were really pulling for me in the fight. People were oddly mean about Pettis, which I thought was insane. But uh, but no, I mean, it, it was a bit of a of a you know left field matchup. But, but after kind of sitting and weighing all the pros and cons, and it, it's a fun fight, especially for the fans. And, uh, you know, I only started training because I was a fan and I am not a hypocrite by any means. And uh, so that, I think the reason I fight like I fight is because I fight like uh, I want to watch guys fight. And, uh, and if I were to sit there and try to land for a, it would just, it would not work out for my own personal kind of circuitry. So I was happy to get this matchup, but I know it's going to be a banger. Yeah, for sure. No, it's not a fun matchup. Um, and you just mentioned there, like you, you're maybe not as interested in, in, as fighting for the title as maybe others are. Um, so, is this kind of like the best case situation for you, like getting these fun matchups, these like big names for you? Yeah, one hundred percent. And uh, I knew you kind of expanded on it, and you spoke about it, but like, why not for the title? The title, the title kind of seems like the the main goal for everybody. Is that just? not a thing you'd like to focus on or, or why exactly is that i mean it, it's it seems like a bit of a cliche and you know when you have what 700 rostered fighters all saying the same thing it's just singing the same tune so many times like certainly not saying if the opportunity presents itself i wouldn't but uh but there's just a you know, again a good example is 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 jeff you know i work with him all the time yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I've been fighting pro fighting for 10 years. You know, before I got to Fortis, I would travel around, especially around Houston. I'd find the best guys to train with. And uh, and with Jeff, he's certainly something special. And, uh, you know, he's, he's higher up in the rankings. And again, you know, as a friend, it'd be awesome to see that accomplishment. But as a team, you know, our ultimate goal is to produce a champion. And I just, you know, he's, he's closer. And, uh, and, and if I had to if I had a choice, I would not fight Jeff. I spar enough with him to know mm -hmm. that would be um, a challenge. And I'm putting that nicely, but, uh, but again, I just, I just think, you know, skill set wise, um, current path wise, it's more appropriate. And like, you know, this is my 12th fight. If I was like 11, you know, if I was like 10 and one or nine and two would be different, but, uh, but I'm very big on following history. You know, it's kind of like how human beings have, you know, evolved to a somewhat peaceful society, but, you know, studying historical facts is a very important aspect in moving forward and making decisions. And, uh, and again, just again, given the current status of my career, I'm very thankful to get this matchup with Pettis. And, uh, and I just think cool fights against cool fighters is a more appropriate, successful relative goal, you know, based upon my, my skills and my stats. Nice. Nice. Um, Yeah, that, that's something maybe you don't hear a lot from from fighters, but it's very, I guess, sobering, very refreshing, um, you know, very honest take from from you as well. Um, how, how important is that to have sort of an honest take? Because, you know, we, we've seen it in MMA guys that perhaps, uh, you know, aim for for the title and and have these uh, goals that maybe um, are not as attainable to them or maybe the chances are, are low. Sure. You know, it's uh, it, being self-aware, I think, is very important for something as potentially dangerous as mixed martial arts and like and it's and it's good when when fighters have that like supreme confidence but i just try to i take a, a much more like logistical approach um and and the reason being is there's a lot at stake physically in these fights and the way i've made decisions in life is is honestly by like weighing statistics and uh, as as much as like wishful thinking is good like a great example is conor mcgregor he believed in himself tremendously and had the skill sets to put guys away you know what is he like 21 and two or three with like 19 knockouts like that's that's very hard to do and uh, and he's done well for himself maybe that's not the best example but he has not won all of these high level fights uh, another great example is kevin lee again like a, a fantastic mindset for success but i think sometimes guys compensate by almost like over hyping themselves so when they meet hardship in a fight it but it can become like extra difficult and one thing i've done since i was an amateur was anytime i'd get an opponent and i'm not the biggest welterweight so i'd fought some guys who were big i'd always envision them to be like way bigger and way better than they really were so when i'd finally see him away and i'd be like hey coach this guy's not that big and my coach would look at me he's like no man he's pretty big i'm like yeah but he's not as big as i thought 
And then like in the fight, I was expected to be very, very difficult. So if the fight is a challenge, I'm like, cool, the game plan is, is, is going according to plan. And if I'm having more success, which has generally been the case, I'm like, cool, this fight is going better than I anticipated. Whereas when guys sometimes downplay their opponents and the fight is more hard than they think, or they, you know, harder than they think it should be, they can sometimes potentially break or make those bad decisions. So I was like, plan on a lot of hardship and I kind of expect the hardship. And then when you face it, it's like, cool, this is what I expected. But then when it's like smoother than you were hoping for, it just, it causes like a snowball effect of, of, of confidence, good decision-making and ultimately good performances. And, uh, and so that has always really helped me. I know my psychological take in MMA has allowed me some success. And, uh, and again, I think I just have like a good mind for battle and, uh, and I'm happy to be doing this. For sure. Uh, lastly, uh, biggest fight of your MMA career, right? Oh, uh, bar none. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Looking forward to it. I'm sure it's going to be a fun fight. Uh, thank you for your time. Cool. Thank you. We'll take our last set of questions from Eric Adison with Kimura.s. Hi, Alex. Um, so this will be your second fight camp during the pandemic, which I'm assuming is a bit different uh, compared to a normal camp. Uh, what has been your biggest challenge during your preparation for the fight? And uh, have you done anything differently compared to a normal fight camp? Yeah. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. Uh, I'll tell you, the worst part about it is like the COVID paranoia when in fight camp, you know, like anytime anyone looks funny, I'll like eyeball them and, and start to question them and stay away. And, and if I'm not in fight camp, I, I, I care a bit less, but uh, that's the only thing that's a little trickier, but I'll tell you the quality of training ha has gone up tremendously as I only had a handful of training partners and for the fight camps, I'd spend the majority of my time in Fortis, of which I would work with Ramez, Razak, and Jeff. So, like, the quality was always super high. And the times I was in Houston, that's when I had to be a bit more selective of my training partners. So, the only real training I would do is with Trevin Giles, which is a good 85er. And uh, so it was fewer training partners, but the training partners that I did make sure were like, were good and safe. All UFC guys who had the same to lose, uh, you know, I did in, in terms of opportunity was, uh, was very good. And then in my home gym at uh, Grease Bottle Woodlands, you know, same thing. We always enacted super strict protocols. Honestly, even before COVID, I've been in fight camps since I was a teenager. So if anyone ever came in, not looking a hundred percent with anything, I would like I would, I would be very mean to them uh, and, and then kick them out. So that precedent was always set very early. And then with all the new stuff, you know, taking active temperatures, you know, one time a guy came in to train and uh, he just didn't sleep very much the day before. And so he had some bags under his eyes. I was like, Hey, get out. He's like, coach, I'm fine. I just didn't sleep much. I was like, whatever, go home and sleep and then come back if you feel better. And uh, everyone at my gym has been super, super cool. From what I heard, a lot of gyms had outbreaks. We, we didn't have one, which was awesome. So it kept like the business side safe and somewhat fruitful considering we almost went out of business from the lockdown. And, uh, and that's been good. So, I mean, the, the, the quality and training went up, especially working only with welterweights and middleweights. Like I had some big guys to move around and then I felt some strength increases and in gains certainly. And that's something my coach had also seen and noticed as well. So I was very happy with, uh, with your results thus far. And I'll tell you staying in this hotel, you know, they give us suites. We have bedrooms, kitchens, and living rooms. And, uh, it's it's actually easier than than other fight weeks. You know, I, I can't wait till we go back to crowds and traveling. But I'll tell you, it's very convenient here. And uh, and even after my Reese McKee fight camp, I was telling my striking coach Matt, he's he goes with me everywhere. He's been with me for over a decade. I'm like, man, I hope I get to fight in the COVID era again, just because it was very convenient. And you know, we, he brought us Roku, so we've been watching fights on Fight Pass and, and, and watching Hulu. And Netflix has been really nice to uh, to have kind of that freedom. So it's not been the worst experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. That's all I have. Cool. That's all the time we have for you today, Alex. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys.